Hello everyone, uh, my name is Guy and I am the uh, Gardens and Grounds Manager here at the BIS. Welcome to the BIS and thanks for joining us today. I've been asked by the Queen's events team to remind you that this session will be recorded. So today I'm going to take you on a trip down memory lane to see your old stomping ground at Hurst and Zoo Castle and also see what might have changed since you were last here. After that, I'll be answering any questions you might have about the gardens, gardening, conservation, rewilding, or comings and goings of the English countryside. Firstly, the estate. So we can remember what's here. We've got the ancient woodland, medieval deer park, ponds of special and scientific interest, rare and protected species, the Pevensey Levels wetland, wildflower meadows, and herds of deer. And of course, there are the gardens, where we have the courtyard with its wisteria adorned cloisters, the Elizabethan garden with its impressive croquet lawns and deep herbaceous borders, the rose garden with an infusion of scents and colours, the Shakespeare garden in which the old swimming pool was inlaid with box hedge parterre. The butterfly garden attracts pollinators from far and wide. The shady or azalea garden is a kaleidoscope of colour in mid-spring. The herb or apothecary garden provides all sorts of culinary delights and medicinal remedies. The magic garden offers a sheltered woodland hideaway underneath the beautiful Japanese haters. And of course, the Folly Garden being a perfect example of quintessential English cottage garden. So, you might be asking yourself, what's changed in the garden? Well, we've been peat free since 2019. As I'm sure you know, peat is a great natural carbon store. And by digging it up from the landscape and using it to grow our plants in for the gardens, we release millions of tonnes of carbon into the atmosphere. So we use peat-free alternatives to grow our plants. Robots now mow our lawns to try and cut down on petrol emissions as well as sound pollution. Some of the castle's lawns are now maintained entirely self-sufficiently by these auto mowers, leaving us time to focus our efforts on the borders and more meaningful activities. We've stopped putting the garden to bed in full. Gone are the days of tidying away the garden at the end of summer. We wait until February to cut back the plants in, in the borders, leaving structure and habitat within the garden over winter, as well as a food source for bats, birds and bugs. Establishing a layered succession planting system. A layered succession planting system is one which borrows from nature and it maximizes on space ecology. It ensures a constant emergence of plants all the way from early spring right into late winter. It reduces weeds, it, it cuts down on watering, and provides a beautiful display nearly all year, as well as a rich food source for pollinators. We've also removed large scale bedding. Why re remove bedding, I hear you cry? This, this is one of the obvious physical changes that you'd see at the castle, in the gardens, where we've established perennial mixed borders in place of traditional bedding systems. Bedding is normally used within the gardens to add instant impact where thousands of annual plants are grown, planted and disposed of up to three times in one year. This is an exhausting effect on the soil as well as the demand on labour, finances and environmental resources. Because of this, we've stopped using this practice and instead we now design the borders with permanent plantings of shrubs, trees, bulbs and herbaceous perennials with self-sown annuals and biennials to give it a longer season of interest, as well as it being kinder to the soil and wildlife too. Here you can see in the pictures the example of the north border, where the annual tulips are, are there. The centre picture shows the design process in which we plotted where the plants and how many there should be and what type they are, and you can see what the border looks like today. A second example of the courtyard garden 
where we've got the Irish U's in the centre and the small strip of the bedding that once used to go around them. Then the drawings, that we've, the scale drawings we've put together to give the, the sense and, and the design to the planting. In the third picture, that's what it looks like today. So we've got future plans for the garden. We want more plants and less lawn. Although lawns add a good visual juxtaposition to the intensity of the planted borders, they are often grass monocultures with very little diversity for pollinators and other wildlife, as well as a limited visual interest. By increasing the quantity and diversity of planting in the garden, it will be more beneficial for pollinators as well as more aesthetically pleasing for us. We'd like to become organic, achieving organic certification Although we always opt for more sensitive approaches, we aim to become cer certified organic, proving that we're not unnecessarily using potentially harmful chemicals. Zero plastic. Horticulture as an industry unfortunately has a very high plastic usage, which is something we're trying to improve on by opting for bagless options of compost or aggregates and using stock uh, such as pots and plant trays as well as purchasing plastic-free alternatives as they become available. Biodiversity studies for the garden, we hope to undertake invertebrate, bird, bat, moth, bee and small mammal surveys each year in the garden with the help of students so we can monitor species populations. We'd like to remodel some of the gardens that have lost their sense of place. After many years, some gardens have become rough around the edges or fallen out of favour. Some have even lost the unique features which made them then. So over time, we'd like to synthetically restore the gardens to their former glory. So what's been happening on the estate? The estate has undergone a 10 year ecological management plan, which has brought about many changes. One is red woodland restoration. We've been managing the health of the woodlands by removing invasive species that upset the delicate woodland ecosystem creating deadwood habitats, carrying out ride management, veteran tree care, pest and disease management, as well as ancient techniques such as coppicing. Deer park restoration. We've been using cattle and sheep as well as the wild deer on the estate to manage the vegetation of the medieval deer park and restore this historic landscape feature back to full health. Desiltation of the ponds. With help of a floating digger, we've removed the buildup of silt from three of the ponds to improve the health of the habitat and protect rare plants within the ecosystem. We've replanted a chestnut avenue. The ancient chestnut avenue, which would have once formed the main entrance to the estate, has become increasingly sparse over the years. So we've replanted the missing trees from the avenue to recreate this historic route. While flower meadows, with the loss of 98% of meadows in the UK, it's become a really important goal for us to create and conserve these beautiful habitats. We now have around 20 acres of wildflower meadow at the castle, where wildlife surveys, as well as dormice, butterfly, dragonfly, and vegetation surveys, we have had help from the Sussex Biodiversity Record Centre. They have carried out a bio blitz on the estate and recorded an incredible diversity and number of species, all the way from pond leaves to peregrines. So how about the future? Rewilding is receiving global attention, and we hope to be involved in these important sustainable efforts by creating our own slice of wilderness here at the castle. Rewilding is the process of returning land back to its uncultivated state, and encouragement and re or reintroduction native spe wild species or proxy species which play a positive role in the natural process of the ecosystem. Species, one species we'd like to use is Sussex cattle. So through the use of rare breed Sussex cattle, this winter they'll play the role of the extinct auroch, which is the precursor to the domesticated ox. These will open and create glades within dense woodland, disturbing thick vegetation and provide the opportunity to increase woodland flora. Along with the non-existent mode scheme, this will increase the environment of, increase the environment for trees and shrubs to become established, 
creating a mosaic of habitat. Herd like sheep. They've been on the estate since 2016. These are used to graze grasslands and browse to those scrub during the winter months to encourage the ideal environment for the establishment of wildflowers and enhance our rich and diverse meadows. Next is Tamworth pigs. We've, they're not yet used on the estate, but we hope to use them um, in the future as modern age wild boars. For their rooting capabilities, we would like them they will plow through their, snap, their snouts through the woodland floor, exposing dormant seed beds and generate a new chance for species establishment. And lastly, surveys. We hope to work with the FISC students undertaking this work, then recording their findings and carrying out surveys to monitor the levels of success through the years. Through this work, supporting the historic, ecological and educational facets of the estate, we hope the castle is considered a symbiotic, meaningful asset that Queen's University are proud to call their own. I hope you've enjoyed your tour around the castle. Thank you for listening. So, um, yeah, please feel free to ask any questions. Anyone has any? We would love to introduce the beaver. At the minute, it's a bit out of our um, it's a bit out of our scope. Um, we need a vast amount of area to be able to introduce the beaver. Uh, there's a local estate nearby. You need over a hundred hectares of, of enclosed space to be able to release the beaver into. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the capacity to do that. We hope one day. That we'll, we have the right environment for them to be able to use the estate and we can benefit from their presence here. The whole estate is uh, 600 acres, uh, 300 acres of it is the, the public estate where. Um, you can walk around entirely uh, free. The, the other parts of the estate, you have to stick to the footpaths. That's more towards the Pevensey levels. So where do we source the animals and where do we get the pigs? So we source the animals, my, the sheep come from local, um, local farmers. Um, my sister actually is a shepherdess, so she helps helps me find the sheep. Um, two of them I raised in my garden last year, uh, which was an interesting project. Um, and now they live on the, uh, in the fields at the castle. Um, the cattle, they come from a local farmer. He is a, um, a regenerative farmer and very conscious of the environment. He's a supporter of the Sussex rare breed cattle, and he'll be bringing his cattle here over the winter to, um, to graze and to hopefully benefit our environment. And the pigs, I don't know yet. Um, if anyone has any recommendations of where to get some good Tamworth pigs, let me know. Um, but hopefully it will be through the rare breed association. Gardens and land managers. Well, normally we have around about three gardeners on the, uh, within, within the gardens and then two estate workers. Um, so it's almost one acre per gardener and then 150 acres per estate worker. We just took part, it's, it's, uh, we notice very high numbers of butterflies generally 
Um, this year was part of the, um, the big butterfly count. Um, and throughout the whole of the UK, we actually saw really low numbers of butterflies because we had such a wet and cold spring. Um, so when most of the broods would have hatched and been out feeding on the plants, a lot of the food sources weren't there or the conditions were so bad they weren't able to feed properly. So although there's a, a good amount of work being done um, to conserve and help butterflies, um, the weather, and as a product of climate change, um, hasn't helped. So, so do I need to read the questions? Read the questions. Read the questions. Uh, will we limit the range of pigs, and have they been very damaging to wild areas here in Canada, and are considered to be a dangerous pest? Yeah, so we used to have wild boars in the UK, um, and they were considered uh, a pest as well. So that's why, I mean, for food as well, they, they were hunted to extinction. So we no longer have those um, boars any longer. Um, and also because they would breed with um, commercial pig breeds, uh, which the farmers didn't like. Um, so they would have been hunted and we would lost that, um, that ecosystem service that they once used to provide. Uh, mainly through the disturbance of soils and grasslands and ground. Um, they're a pest for agriculture, perhaps, um, but can be beneficial within the wider environment if, if they're managed. Um, so, you know, with pigs, it would have to be extremely, uh, there would have to be a lot of control with it. Um, a local estate called the Net Estate, they recommend that you have one pig per 100 acre. To, to have a, um, a, a positive uh, benefit to the ecological function of the, of the habitat. Um, so what we would do is we would use fencing uh, in small areas and expose that area to a small amount of time to create an, uh, an acceptable level of disturbance and take the pigs away um, so that the land could recover and we could, we could um, receive the benefits of, of their involvement within the landscape, but we wouldn't want them to be so present that they would then be uh, detrimental to the health of the, the habitat. Are there still a high number of bunnies in the fields of Costa Beta Hall residents? I recall there being an overpopulation of bunnies on the ground. There is still a lot of bunnies. Yeah, so we have, we, we have a love-hate relationship with the bunnies. Um, we still have a lot, and uh, we do uh, control them, usually through humane efforts, if possible, uh, by, by fencing them out of the gardens and things. Um, we've had an increase in birds of prey, um, so we have a lot of buzzards. We start to get red kites, and, and these <laughs> help to keep uh, the population under control. Um, yeah, we still have a lot of bunnies. There are deer on the estate. So, oh, sorry, I have to read the question. Are there deer on the estate? If so, uh, are there numbers controlled by predators, hunters, or other means? So, yes, there are deer on the estate. We have 30 fallow deer, um, and we have an unknown population of roe deer, which are native UK deer. Um, and we have spotted this year a couple of muntjuk deer, which are non native. Um, so the numbers are controlled um, because by hunters um, because uh, the UK countryside is so fragmented by woodland and agriculture, they move amongst it. Um, and we try to set a limit on how we will control that population, known, on, known for our, our requirements and how, and how many we see. Um, and yeah, so we, we mainly control the fallow deer. Uh, the road deer don't present much of a problem for us. Uh, the recommended stocking density is, uh, I think, one per 250 acres, I think. So in terms of that, we're, we're hugely overpopulated by deer because um, of the loss of the, the European and brown bear 
um, and rules and things like that. So we have we are forced to take action so that they they don't negatively um, impact on our environment. Um, also, I think it's it's changed that we are um, predominantly we have um, in the southeast of England non-native road fallow uh, deer instead of the red deer that we, we originally would have had. Um, yeah, so um, other things that we're up to on the estate, people seem to be interested on the wildlife factor is we're going to be working with students this year to have a look at um, American mink that are on the estate. So we're going to be building uh, floating rafts uh, and floating them out on the moat with a sand uh, trap in it or a sand pit so we can see what passes through the, the, um, through the, the raft and see if we do have American mink they cause uh, devastation within the environment through um, eating uh, small mammals um, and uh, small, small native birds and bird eggs as well. There are some happy stories as well. So uh, the water vole, um, we think that they are very likely present on the estate. Um, we're hoping to see the effects of that. And the Eurasian otter as well. Uh, it's highly likely that they will be within the estate soon, and that's something we'd love to encourage. And we'll be surveying to, to try and find out when they do and if they do arrive. And some other wildlife facts uh, we have, um, we would like to be able to encourage. Um, the swallowtail butterfly to our ponds is only found uh, predominantly in an area east of England in Norfolk and very, very rarely found in the south of England. But we're lucky enough to have a sole food plant for the swallowtail butterfly um, that grows in our ponds. That's milk parsley. So we have the first part of the, uh, the recipe and we're just missing the, the second part. If we could bring them together then we could have a really successful population of, um, of rare butterfly on the estate, which would be lovely. Our highest priority uh, for the estate at the moment is being able to establish a, um, a, a datum point um, for the species uh, we currently have. We'd like to be able to by knowing what we have on the estate, then we can measure our success in the future. Um, and we'd be able to tell if our efforts with rewilding are having a, 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 a positive effect, and, and if so, how positive it will be. So are there any particular insect or pest problems in the garden? There are, there are quite a few. We've had a very, very wet summer um, it's rained a lot, um, so we've seen a lot of plant health issues from that. One of them is uh, verticillium wilt. Um, so one of our, our big Indian bean trees is actually um, that's that's started dropping limbs. Unfortunately, the only thing you can do is um, grass it over for 15 years, or you can plant a conifer tree in its place. Uh, we've had a wonderful high population of slugs and snails because of the, the wet weather, which has provided all sorts of um, fun and trying to keep the plants healthy. Um, so good, good for the birds, keep, it keeps them well fed, but maybe a few too many for slugs and snails this year. Uh, other pests and diseases we have within the gardens are our malaria, which is um, a honey fungus. Uh, it's a native fungus, but we're starting to see it more prevalent, prevalently in the ancient trees, um, especially the um, sweet chestnuts, 
So starting to see dieback of these 300-year-old trees in the canopy um, because the mushrooms are slowly um, taking the nutrients from its roots and, and actually starting to kill the roots of the tree. And there's not, not much that you can do once that's established. Um, in terms of preventions for the, the pests that we do have, um, if we go back to slugs and snails, we use sheep's wool from the sheep we have on the estate. Uh, come shearing time, wool doesn't have a great financial value, so we use it uh, to mulch the beds for lanolin oil within the fleece. We place around delphiniums or hostas, um, so the uh, slugs or snails are discouraged from, from actually travelling up to the plants to, to nibble on them. Um, one thing that you would notice if you were here over six or seven years ago is the woodland had a lot of rhododendron, um, which would have been a pinky purple flower. Um, for con purposes of conservation, we've had to um, remove a lot of the rhododendron because of one of the pests called Phytophthora morum, uh, and it kills native uh, trees uh, and poisons the, the woodland. So we're having to remove that to, to save the ancient woodland on the estate. So I've got a question. And Anne asks, in the spring, do you dig the soil between the perennials or does loosening the soil only encourage weeds? Yeah, so um, we are trying to discourage uh, ourselves from, from soil disturbance. Um, one thing that is known about disturbing soil is, as you said, bringing the, bringing the seed bank to the surface, especially if you've used a lot of homemade compost. Um, so being able to leave it in situ and just remove the weeds from the top means you're not bringing fresh weeds to germinate later on in that time. Um, also, disturbing the soil and digging big holes just releases carbon uh, and as well. And, and we, we're a very clay soil, so it also creates a lot of um, uh, uh, moisture, uh, uh, essentially a pool of water um, that, that then sits there. Also, the, the layered succession planting should mean that we actually won't have room to be able to dig around the plants because the idea is that we would have these, these perennials, these, these permanent plants sitting within the border and amongst the gaps, uh, amongst these two gaps, you would then interweave um, spring bulbs perhaps. So by disturbing that soil, you'd be disturbing um, plants for an early or later season. So we try, we try not to do too much digging. One of the things that we are trying to practice is um, a, a tickling of the soil, because with, um, with some weeds, you actually get the, the attractive annuals or biennials like the foxgloves or the bascoms or the Welsh poppies um, and you would like these to germinate. So by slightly disturbing the soil, only very lightly and using an, uh, an inert weed-free compost on top of that or mulch, then you'll only generate a very small amount of germination that's controllable. And you'll, so you'll still get your beneficial self-sown annuals or biennials, uh, and hopefully less of the weed species. I think we have a mold moles, yes. Yes, we have a mold problem. Um, so <laughs> we have a good amount of moles on the estate. In the winter, you, you bet rarely see them because the ground is so wet um, and then all of a sudden as summer comes the worms start to travel and move the soil and the moles start chasing them around um, and we see them the molehills everywhere it, it's uh, i wonder if someone would be able to do a study for us because i'd like to understand the benefits um, of the drainage that they provide for the estate which 
must have some beneficial uh, uh, service for, for us, but they do create slightly unsightly molehills. Although there is a benefit for this in that we use that soil um, to use as potting soil and to make up compost mix because it's very fine and often very sandy soil. So we use that to add into, um, into compost mixtures. So they're not all bad. We do have, uh, so I keep forgetting to read the questions. Do you have any volunteer help from Queen students? Yes, we do. We have been working with um, Con Ed. So we've had a group of 10 students with us that work with a, um, a SEN school called Glyndegap. They come in once a week and they work in the gardens almost independently with the students. Um, and they help a great deal. Um, we, are, we have a, a volunteer programme where students can attend. Not a great deal at the moment, but we hope that's going to be going to build. Over, over previous years, we've always um, had really good uh, relationship with the students coming to volunteer, learning, having some outdoors time um, and being able to blow up some steam. Yep, so uh, the other week we went out uh, with the health sciences um, class and we went through the gardens and as part of their studies we identified common garden plants and uh, their health properties that could be identified within, um, within our modern plants that also would have been used historically and have transferred into modern medicine as well. So there was some truth into their medicinal uses. Um, one, one obvious one, if you remember, we had lots of yew hedging in the gardens. Yew is famously poisonous and, and a few handfuls or some of the seeds from the berries will kill you. But scientists have discovered that it actually has alkaloids that can fight forms of cancer and stop uh, cell mutation uh, and is now being used to save people's lives. Any more questions? Does anyone have any questions? I could talk about, oh, we do have some more questions. Oh, okay. So do you still have a field site where students could participate in archeological excavations? Yes, we do. Um, it's still there. It was dug, I think, three years ago. Um, and it's still, uh, it, you can still see the formations, but it's largely covered in now. Um, but you can, the, the dig site, site still exists, and we've actually opened a new dig site close to the folly, uh, which is the Gamekeeper's Lodge, and we're trying to find out the exact location and, um, and, and find evidence of its use. Um, that's part of the um, Environments of Change project that's going on. I could talk about the aesthetic of the gardens, um, aspect of the garden design will be inspired by the planting of Lalva and Latham, two of the big restorers of the gardens. We're hoping to draw from their passion and some of their flamboyance towards um, the, the decoration of the castle. Latham, of course, uh, uh, brought the arts and um, art deco um, to the castle interior, and we would like to be able to 
uh, replicate that style and that design within the gardens and channeling that creativity and that process. We'd like to encourage a more romantic and loose approach to the gardens that offers as much for nature as it does for um, the people um, visiting and students enjoying the area. So we've just been asked, are there still swans? And there are a few swans. We don't see many of them anymore. Um, I don't think that's anything we've done, but they, they're, they're often out in the um, Pevensey levels, out on the, um, on the ditches and within the splashes, out on the levels. We occasionally get them on the um, Folly Point as well. We have a good population of teal, uh, Canada geese, grey lags. Uh, each morning when I come in, especially this time of year, we see cormorants up on the turrets um, watching for the um, watching for the fish. We see them diving in. Um, herons as well. A very good population of herons um, to keep the, the fish numbers under control. This year, when you enter the south entrance of the drawbridge, we had um, house martins that were nesting uh, just above the arch. And um, as you came through, they would fly, swoop around, and would um, hunt and catch all, all the small insects across the moat. So we've just been asked, is the estate uh, ever used for TV or movie filming? And it is, it is occasionally. Um, we were in the original, or the 1980s, BBC um, Narnia production, which is going back a bit now. Uh, we have been in Summerland, we have, uh, which is a wonderful movie if you'd like to see glimpses of the castle. It's set around the local area. I don't know any of the actors, but they are famous. Um, and there is also, uh, we had Hunted, which is a UK um, game show. I had to explain to one of my colleagues to mow a perfect circle in the middle of a beautiful hay meadow. Uh, he didn't understand why, and it seemed nonsensical at the time until the giant helicopter landed to do an evacuation of the game of the contestants and things started to make sense. Uh, we also had Vlog It here, which is an um, a auction antiques program. And we have had a uh, landscape artist of the year here, uh, where they painted some beautiful um, scenes of the front of the castle and around by the orchard looking uh, to the, the south aspect of the castle and the Observatory Science Centre as well. Yeah, we've been featured a good few times on the news lately, um, especially over lockdown. Um, we did a tulip uh, appeal where we grew thousands of tulips and uh, had to close the gardens so we wanted to give them to people so they could still appreciate and um, get a, a piece of nature within their homes. So we cut, cut our tulips and bunched them up and gifted them to the local community and essential workers. Okay, so has anyone got any other questions? question now. All right, so in that case, I'll, um, our time's up. Uh, thanks again. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of homecoming. Thank you. <laughs>